this could potentially be a two-part video or a three-part video, depending on how long I talk. So that's just fair warning for you. So if you are watching this and you're like, oh, I'm gonna get all my information in one video, sorry, you gotta wait for the second video. And if you're watching this in the future, just go watch the other two videos or whatever, how many videos I make out of this one video. So with that said, that's that's gonna be how this, I don't know how long I'm gonna talk. So let's go through it. What's up YouTube? So before you decide to breed, you need to know the basics. And you also need to know the intermediate skills and information and you also need to know expert because eventually you're going to get there right so and the expert video if i do make so the i'm going to try to do beginner and intermediate in this video so it's going to be like bearded dragon breeding 101 and 102 i guess <laughs> um and then the inner the expert version of this video is going to be just for members so if you want to get into the nitty-gritty and the possibles and the and the outcomes and the blah blah blahs. Go watch the expert video. So essentially, beginner information that you need to know, that you need to know. Sorry, I just woke up, so I'm trying to wake myself up as I make this video. And it's all right. Let me just get straight into the video because I know this was going to be a long one. Beginner information. There's only two different types. All right. There's only three different types of morphs. Color is not a morph. Put it out the back. Color is not a morph. Nobody cares about color unless you're working for color. I know I, you guys, oh my God, how can you say that? Color is not a morph. Color is polygenic. So that means it could change drastically, even though the parents could be, you know, both red. You could have an orange baby. That's how that works. Then, Sorry, a dragon stared at me. I get distracted easily. Then, the three different types of morphs. We have dominant. Dominant morphs are morphs that will replicate with only one parent carrying this morph. That's it. There's incomplete dominant, which is similar to dominant. So one parent has the morph. It can replicate it in the offspring. But incomplete dominant is treated somewhat like a uh, recessive when it comes to DNA strands. Because an incomplete dominant, if there's two copies of the incomplete dominant morph on the DNA strand, then there is what's called a super, which will then only produce that morph in the offspring. So if you breed a super of that morph to a normal, all of the babies will be the morph just one copy of the morph, not two copies, like the super version. So essentially, the parent that is a super will produce, will pass on one copy of that morph into every single offspring. Now, there's not really that many or any uh, incomplete dominant morphs that I know of in bearded dragons. And you guys are probably going to be like, well, technically, leatherback is an incomplete dominant morph because you create silkies if you breed leatherbacks to leatherbacks. That is a technicality because when you breed a silky back to a normal scale, you get leatherbacks and there's a chance you get scaled babies. So I don't personally have never done that. So I can't say for a fact that's going to be a possibility there. Um, I just know for a fact that leatherback acts like a dom dominant unless you breed a silky, which still acts like a dominant. I'm not really sure. It's hard for me to speak on something that I have no experience on because I would never do silkies because I would never do anything unethical. So there's your take. Oh, he doesn't find he finally doesn't know something. So with that said, all the morphs that we have in bearded dragons are either dominant or recessive. A recessive morph is a morph that requires two copies in order to be displayed on the offspring. So that means you have to have heterozygous of that morph on both parents. So let's talk about het zero. Het zero has to be in the parent and has to be, or the mom and the dad, in order for the offspring to have a possibility of being a visual zero. 
visual zero is just exactly what that sounds like. When you're a visual of a morph, that means you are displaying that morph. That's it. Hat means that you carry one copy of that morph. So in terms of genetics, one copy means you carry the morph. Two copies means you visually display that morph. So if you hear me saying that, that is because two copies means it's a visual zero. One copy means it's a hat zero. Now, now that we got that out of the way, there's polygenic traits. Polygenic traits are traits that are line bred. So that means there's a variety of them because they are line bred. So it's never going to be one specific look just because the parents looked a certain way. This goes with tiger. So if you have a tiger, blue bar, whatever you want to call it, and you breed it to a normal, there is a chance the babies will go from normal looking all the way up to the parent to the parent that had the tiger in the blue bars, somewhere in between, possibly nothing, possibly all of it. It's very, very wild. Now, polygenic is how it's just line bred. So essentially, if you were to breed that blue bar that you have to another blue bar, you could have offsprings that uh, most of the offsprings will look like the parents. Then you'll have offsprings that look like even more defined blue bars, thicker blue bars, because that is what line bread does. This is also the case with genetic stripe. Genetic stripe is the same way. Genetic stripes before just used to be stripes that were kind of straight. People were like, I like those stripes. Let's breed those stripes together. Then they got even straighter and even straighter and even straighter until we got what we have today, which are the super straight thunderbolts. So these are still considered genetic stripes. People before this year, well, actually, even now, actually, uh, people would think that genetic stripe is a dominant morph or not. No, they believe genetic stripe was an incomplete dominant morph. And an incomplete dominant morph, as you recall, you need one copy to show the morph. You need two copies to create a super. And that's what they thought a thunderbolt was, a super genetic stripe, which in terms of a super genetic stripe, if that was the case, that being the super genetic stripe carries two copies of that morph, passing one copy of the morph to every offspring, meaning that every offspring would be a genetic stripe if that was the case. I debunked that this year because I produce regular scaled, regular stripes from my Thunderbolt this year, and no one else is really doing pairings like that. If you look at what people are doing, people are breeding genetic stripe to the ge genetic stripe. How likely is it that you're going to get a normal stripe from a genetic stripe to a genetic stripe or genetic stripe to a thunderbolt? And people are still probably complaining about the fact that, no, it has to be a super genetic stripe because look at all the babies, they're genetic stripes. Well, when I brought this to everybody's attention, I said, well, look at this baby out of my thunderbolts, super genetic stripe, and then look at this baby, and then look at this baby. Are these all genetic stripes? Oh, no, those aren't genetic stripes. Well, guess what? They came from a super genetic stripe, according to what you're saying. So if that was the case, all these babies would be genetic stripe. But that's not the case because that's polygenic. Polygenic means that the babies are going to have different levels of the morph the parent has. And genetic stripe is a morph. Color is not a morph. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how can genetic stripe be a morph and color is not a morph? Because color is something that can drastically change from parent to offspring. And the same thing happens with red monsters. People are loving these red monsters. Red monsters, while they are mostly all dark red, there's a possibility that when you breed a red monster to a non-red monster, you're going to get orange dragons. You might even get citrus-looking dragons. So it really just depends on the pairing. So, all right. Where was I headed? So now we talked about polygenic, we talked about color, we talked about dominant, incomplete dominant, and we talked about recessive. Those are the basics. The basics are, there's different types of morphs. What you need to find out is what morphs are you dealing with? Let's run through them. We have Dunner, we have Leatherback, we have Genetic Stripe, we have Hypo, we have Translucent, we have zero, we have Wiblets, and then there's also even a recessive leatherback, which is more for expert people because if you're messing with recessive leathers, 
That means you know exactly what you're doing and just this is not going to be a video for you. So recessive leatherback, we're not going to talk about that because not a lot of people mess with it. And then there's the people that have the German giants. What happened to German giants? The same thing that's happening to red monsters right now. People grab the German giant. Oh, what's a German giant? These are bearded dragons that were measurably longer and bigger and heavier than what we have today. Today, we have small, obese bearded dragons. Back then, we had slender, large bearded dragons. Red monsters are going the way of German giants. In a positive way, kind of compared to German giants, went away in a negative way. Red monsters are being outcrossed now, gladly, happily. They're finally being out outcrossed. Outcrossed now to the fact that the red monster bloodline is dwindling into the other bloodlines that we had. And now there's a smaller percentage per animal of red monster lineage, which is not a bad thing. We still have the red monster look, but we don't have the bad health issues that come from red monsters being inbred. What happened to German giants? German giants, the same thing kind of occurred. People were trying to get bearded dragons to be bigger than they needed to be. So they would breed German giants to them, hoping that they would have a massive bearded dragon and all the bearded dragons eventually will become massive. That's the opposite of what happened. All of the bearded dragons eventually became towards the smaller side of things because in order for you to get more massive bearded dragons, you have to take the massive bearded. So I say massive, they were closer to like over 30 inches long and they were closer to like one kilogram in weight versus now we have bearded dragons that are like 20 inches long and about four or 500 grams in weight. So it made a huge difference, okay? So, uh, where was I? I forgot. I don't forgot where I was. So people, in order to get a larger bearded dragon, what that had needed to be done was you take that German giant, you breed it to a normal, right? Let's say a 20 inch bearded dragon to a 30 inch bearded dragon. You breed it, let's say you get some 25 inch bearded dragons. You take those 25 inch bearded dragons and you breed them back to the German giant. This is called line breeding. Line breeding is only lasting for two or three seasons, no more. If you do any more, you're considered inbred at that point. Then you just keep going until you get the larger bearded dragons. The problem with that is eventually you end up with only a few offsprings, maybe 20 or so that are closer to German giant bloodline than they were to regular bearded dragon bloodline. And in those cases, what are you really doing? You're just either breeding for German giant or you're either breeding for regular sized bearded dragons. And they should have been kept separate this entire time, but that's not the case. People bred them together and eventually all the bearded dragons, because they couldn't find more German giants, they kept breeding the bearded dragons back to the smaller bearded dragons. And eventually all bearded dragons became 20, 22 inch bearded dragons instead of 25, 27, 30 inch bearded dragons. There you go. There's your history lesson. Now people are, oh, do we still have German giant bloodline today? Yes and no. German giants do not exist anymore. What we have is German giant bloodline. Bloodlines means that they carry the lineage of that one dragon or that, that group of dragons. Right now, a German giant bloodline doesn't mean anything. It just means that your dragon might be slightly bigger than the rest of them. Doesn't mean nothing. So if you want to replicate a German giant, it's gonna take you several, several, several years and a lot of work because you will have to find the largest dragons that you can find. And when I mean large, I mean long. I do not mean heavy because, oh, it hurts me. It hurts me to see people brag about the size of their bearded dragons. They'll be like, this is my bearded dragon. She is 600 grams. And you'll be like, well, how long is she? She's 18 inches long. Are you freaking kidding me? 18 inches and 600 grams? What are you doing? That's a death sentence. Oh, my bearded dragon is 600 grams. Well, how long is it? 22 inches. Well, that's a little bit more, you know, doable. That's a little bit better. Okay. A four inch difference. That makes a whole lot of difference in weight. Like, for example, I have, I want to say he's probably, he has a tail nap, so I can't really go based off of him. Uh, because that tail net probably, I would say maybe 10, 15, 20 grams or, or so of weight. Um, it's about this much gone. 
but he is probably like 320. And he is, I want to say, probably 19, 20 inches long. I haven't actually measured him in a while. He keeps growing on me. And he is about 390. And you're probably wondering, well, you just said these dragons were 600. Why is those dragons so big? Huh? My dragons never, ever, ever go over 450 grams. Ever. Ever. 450, that's my limit. And even then, I'm like, that's probably too much. 350, 400, that's my sweet spot right there. 300 to 350 is also a sweet spot for smaller dragons because of the fact that they're smaller dragons. Okay? Bearded dragons don't always top out at 22. Bearded dragons on average are about 18 inches. And when you say average, that means there's smaller ones and there's bigger ones. Okay? So sometimes you get a smaller one that's, you know, 300 grams. And sometimes you get a bigger one that's 400 grams. But 18 inches is on average. 350 is on average. That's how the ideal weight for an average bearded dragon is 350 grams. If you go bigger than 18 inches, you're looking closer to 400, 450. If you go smaller than 18 inches, you're looking at 300, 325, closer to 350, somewhere in that area. Oh, I don't know. I got a mic finally. I don't know if you guys have noticed. You guys are like, oh my God, he got a mic. No. Uh, so I had to buy a receiver because my receiver was broken. And hopefully I haven't been filming this entire video with hoping that the receiver was the issue and I'm over here filming and it's not the receiver, it's the mic. So hopefully that's not the case. Um, all right. Those are the basics. The basics are the different types of morphs we have, the different types, the different morphs we have, and then how we go about breeding. And one thing that I always say, and if you've heard me say this, then you know what I'm about to say. Probably, probably not. Never, ever breed your pet store dragons. Never breed a normal bitter dragon. Never breed any bitter dragons you don't know the lineage of, the genetics of, the recessives, the nothing. If you don't know something about that bearded dragon, chances are you shouldn't be breeding it. What does that mean? Well, if you don't know what you're going to get, then how do you know what to pair? If I don't know that this dragon is het Wiblets and I pair it to a Wiblets, I don't know what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a bunch of Wiblets and possibly, possibly have issues. Now, that's for a different video. But essentially, just to top it off right now, you don't breed visual to het for Wiblets or Zeros. You don't be breed visual to visual for Wiblets or Zeros. The best way to get visual zeros and visual wiblets out of a pairing is het to het, okay? And um, if you made this far into the video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss anything that I put out in the future. As always, peace.